I think we'll kick off our conversation with Judy by showing a clip of her um, award-winning film, the documentary about Crip Camp. So can we roll that, uh, roll that whatever it is? Video. Wait, you want me to tell what happened? <laughs> well, two people got cramped and they're spreading. We were all very hyper about it. And I have to go shower some people. I'll see you later. I wanted to be part of the world, but I didn't see anyone like me in it. I hear about a summer camp for the handicapped run by hippies. Somebody said you probably will smoke dope with the counselors. And I'm like, sign me up. We are the Camp Jeanette and find yourself. There I was. I was in Woodstock. You wouldn't be picked to be on the team back home. But at Jeanette, you had to go up the back. Even when we were that young, we helped empower each other. It was allowing us to recognize that the status quo was not what it needed to be. The world always wants us dead. We live with that reality. At the time, so many kids just like me were being sent to institutions. It was just a continual struggle. Most disabled people, like myself, are unable to use public transportation. We needed a civil rights law of our own. A rehabilitation program has been vetoed by the president because it was cost prohibitive. We decided we were going to have a demonstration. You get the call to action to the barricades. A small army of the handicapped have occupied this building for the past 11 days. So many people from Camp Jeanette found their way into the building. The FBI cut off the phones. The deaf people went, we know what to do. That's how we communicated to the people outside the building. The Black Panther Party would bring a hot meal. We were like this. We are the strongest political force in this country. We will no longer allow the government to oppress disabled individuals. And I would appreciate it if you would stop shaking your head in agreement when I don't think you understand what we are talking about. <laughs> What we saw at that camp was that our lives could be better. If you don't demand what you believe in for yourself, you're not going to get it. I said. We like to see um, handicapped people depicted as people. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that was just that was just a short clip of a very, very amazing film. If you haven't seen it yet, I would uh, I would absolutely recommend do it tonight. It's it's a great way to spend GAD. It's a great way to to find the energy and strength you need to do the work that we all do together. So quickly, I will just uh, for those of you, if there is anyone here who doesn't know about Judy's life, I would be surprised. But let me just quickly tell you that when um, Judy was paralyzed from polio at 18 months. And so she spent her whole life fighting for equality. I mean, she, um, from, the, from being described by a school administrator as a fire hazard because she was in a, a wheelchair, she was denied ad admission to public school. So she begins by being taught from home, then she attends a, a segregated, uh, a segregated special education class, and finally a regular high school. A few years later, she won a lawsuit against the New York City school system because they denied her a teacher's license because of her disability. Her activism was honed during her camp experience at Camp, camp Jeanette that you just saw. It was documented in the film Crip Camp, which is just a remarkable document about empowerment within the community of people with disabilities. And it was produced and well, it was produced by um, Barack and Michelle Obama's foundation, but it was directed by one of the camp um, attendees, which I just, you know, it's, it, it's just the perfect, um, I just wonder why why it took so long, but that's one of the questions I'm gonna we're we're gonna talk about. Um, Judy's actions set a precedent. I mean, it fundamentally improved the rights of people with disabilities. She was she was still quite a young woman 
when uh, she rolled her wheelchair through the doors of the US Department of Health, Education and Welfare in San Francisco. And she led a group of people with disabilities that would continue to grow over the next several days. It became known as the Section 504 sit-in and was the longest takeover of a governmental building in US history. That remains a record, 24 or 25 days. She worked with a community of over 150 disabled activists and their allies, and she successfully pressured the Carter administration to implement protection for disabled people's rights. My belief is that this action sparked the national movement that led to the creation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so young Judy, who you saw there on the film, she evolved into an internationally recognized disability leader. She served in leadership positions in the Clinton and Obama administration. She served as a senior fellow at the Ford Foundation. My, my own experience, I had a cousin whose husband was an assistant secretary of some kind in the Clinton Department of Labor. So I was preparing to visit DC and he said to me, so, you know, I'm kind of a big wig in the government. Is there anyone special you'd like to meet within the administration? And I said, can you introduce me to Judy Human? <laughs> and I did get to meet her. So through my own years of advocacy here at Nobility, I have often channeled my inner badass inspired by Judy's example. And finally, she's written a book. She's written the memoir, Being Human, an unrepentant, memoir of a disability rights activist, along with Kristen Joyner. Her personal narrative of demanding inclusion is very candid and in many, many places it's quite irreverent as we would expect from Judy. It invites your, the readers to imagine and to imagine a world in which ableism is a thing of the past and to make that world real. So in addition to the documentary Crip Camp, which was produced by uh, or directed by James Lebrecht and Norman and Nicole Newham. See, I'm so nervous, but Relax. she didn't stop just with the movie and a book, right? Judy is now also a producer of The Human Perspective, which is a podcast and a YouTube channel that aims to share the beauty of the disability community. So as you can tell, I could sing Judy's praises all day, but I'm sure you would much rather hear from her. And I know I would. So help me welcome Judy to the Access U community. I'll get the conversation started with a few questions. I hope you will put your questions and comments for Judy in the chat and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. And Judy, I'm gonna start. With, I'm gonna start. I'm, First of all, you're thank start. you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't let you go on talking about me that way, not say anything. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Second of all, I'm really glad to be a part of this. And third of all, I'm sorry we can't touch the flesh. Um, and let me also say a couple of things. One is we're also um, now, uh, you can go to Spotify and to Apple and you can hear podcasts that we're doing. And we started doing podcasts because you can go about your business listening to this as a podcast, and it's also under the human perspective. And I really appreciate, you know, Sharon, all the kind words. Let me really say that everybody knows in the audience that no one person ever does all of this. And so I'm so very well grateful, but also I think historically looking back at the number of disabled people then and now in the future who are like all of you on this uh, Zoom call today, doing this because you're trying to right a wrong. Yeah. And uh, the reason why you're involved in an organization is because you know individually we can't right all wrongs. And it doesn't mean that we've righted all wrongs, but it does mean that the stronger we get, the more specialized we get in areas, the more collaborative we are, with disabled individuals um, who are users and experts and others, the more quickly we're gonna be able to move forward. So to me, it's thank you to everybody. And I have a bigger mouth than some people. So at this point in time, maybe I get a little bit no, more notoriety, but 
that certainly doesn't mean that there aren't thousands of other people who really make all these things ultimately happen. So thank you very much, Sharon. Now we'll go to the questions. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, yeah, I, I am. My, my first question was just why so long? Why did you take so long to write a book with the, I mean, your accomplishments were amazing from the time you were 30 years old. And uh, I just, you know, I, I thought, wow, she waited all this time to write it down. Well, first of all, I never thought when I, I know there are lots of people today who at 30 are writing their memoirs, but I never even thought of that as something like I was 30. And yes, I'd done interesting things, but who would read a book about me when I was 30? And then as I was, you know, 40 and 50 and 60, and, you know, doing a lot of public speaking, people would on a regular basis say to me, why don't you write a book? Well, I didn't write a book because I neither had the confidence nor the aptitude to really write a book um, and certainly didn't have the time. And then really, um, I'm 73 now. Well, let me also say, I'm a 73 year old white woman wearing red glasses with kind of a pinkish red lipstick. I have brown hair, I have on a floral blouse. We're in our foyer and um, have family pictures. And in the background is our dining room office with lots of plants and Frida Kahlo um, hot plates hung up on the wall. And uh, I like Frida Kahlo and many friends and family have given me all this uh, Frida Kahlo, various things. I have so many different things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I look and where we are. But um, when I was older, I started thinking a little bit about writing a book, but actually it came about because a friend was working with the company um, and they reached out to me to see if I would be interested in writing a book. And I said, I'd have to have somebody else work with me on writing it. And so they hooked me up with the company that I got an agent. The agent helped me get Kristen Joyner, who really um, is a great writer. And we wrote the book together. So it was a real collaborative effort, obviously. It's my story. Uh, she is the writer, and we spent a lot of time uh, talking, she'd write, I'd edit. It was a pretty laborious process and it took about three, three and a half years for it to get done. And why not till now? It's what I was saying, the time wasn't right. Um, I didn't have the right, I mean, I was working. All the things that Sharon said, I'm still working. All the things that Sharon said, plus I had 20 years working in the nonprofit world with the Center for Independent Living and the World Institute on Disability and doing a lot of domestic and international traveling. That to me was always uh, more important than writing a book. Yeah, I, um, I wondered also about the title of the book. Why were you unrepentant? Was there, um, was there an expectation that you should have a different attitude or um, are you just being sassy? <laughs> I think that's what we're trying to really demonstrate that there's no regret yeah. at all. And, uh, you know, I think people, I don't know, I think that people sometimes feel that maybe, you know, you would have done something differently, could have done something differently. I don't feel apologetic about anything that I've been involved with, really. Well, I'm glad to hear I've that. I've done more and still do more. Difference. I think that's really what's important. Yeah. Where we are, where we need to go, who we need to bring with us. You know, I was surprised when, um, because I did, I, I saw a couple of interviews with you and your co-author, and I was really surprised to learn because her history, right, was uh, that she had written about inclusion and human rights and empowerment 
and she not lives in the Bay Area. Not but on she was, Yeah, and she was still unaware. One of the one of the interviews where she said, "I walked past the Center for Independent Living every day, and I didn't know about this history, even though she lived there." And you know that that just astounded me because when I was a kid, well, I was a kid in the Bay Area too, north north of San Francisco, but um, and I'm I'm right behind you, Judy. I'm almost your age, and um, my brother drove a truck. A, a food truck for the Black Panthers. So oh. I knew all about it because he would tell me about, you know, doing this, this delivery for these crazy people in wheelchairs who won't leave the building. And, <laughs> you know, it was like, uh, he was like, well, you know, I thought I was going to be delivering to the little black kids, but I'm delivering to this building with a bunch of crazy people in wheelchairs who won't go home. <laughs> and so I was kind of surprised to learn that Kristen had never heard of it. And I wondered what were your thoughts about why disability history continues to be marginalized in that way? Is there, do you have any thoughts about why that should be the case? I mean, I think it's a question that all of us working in this area continue to ask. Even when people know they don't necessarily believe it's important. I think we're looking at technology as an example, you know, the fact that we can have resistance and things going on in the courts where there's dispute about whether or not a company should have their websites accessible so that disabled people can use them you know you're just left scratching your head but i think you know the bottom line is disability is moving forward crip camp my book many other people's books um more attention being paid through the creation of new groups and programs focusing on media and the absence of disabled people in the media is slowly allowing people to learn more about disability. But we're still, our story is being told by us, but not yet enough. We are still not making the mainstream talk shows on a regular basis when looking at uh, issues around discrimination. So when you look at Black Lives Matter, which obviously has been a critical voice in allowing uh, people in our society and around the world to really understand issues around oppression based on race. And when we look at the number of people who have been murdered by the police and we see a high percentage of those individuals with psychosocial disabilities and other forms of disabilities. That's not really discussed. Um, when we look at issues around unemployment and the high rate of unemployment amongst disabled people even before COVID, um, we do not typically discuss disability. And when you look at disability frequently, like you know, in the main news, all too frequently, we're seeing stories of, I'm stammering only because we're seeing stories that where people are being highlighted for doing things that should just be typical and normal. Um, I think about three stories over the last year of people with intellectual disabilities who are being allowed to play with their high school basketball team for one game or a baseball game or a young woman who's playing golf. Um, all very important things to demonstrate that people with various forms of disabilities can and are doing things that people expected us not to be able to do. But the way the programs are illustrated and highlighted, they don't talk about why have we thought this way. They talk about people as being inspirations. And isn't it wonderful that this high school team allowed this child with a disability to participate? It's just the messages are still wrong. So it's the absence of the story. It's the absence of disabled people in the media rooms, in the television rooms, in the film rooms, on and on, So and journalism. So that unless you know people like your brother, um, I think there are many people today, Sharon, 
who may have heard of the ADA but have no idea what it is. If it's not something which people are learning about on a pretty regular basis and being given examples of, most people, including many disabled people, don't know what their rights are. And so it's really, I think, as our movement gets stronger, as we're able to bring more attention to the work that's being done that's helping people advance. I mean, if you look at COVID right now, you look at the number of people who've died, 50, 60% of those people are disabled individuals. Anyone living in a nursing home, anyone with an underlying, con underlying condition like diabetes or hypertension, uh, those are all disabilities. People in restricted environments, people without appropriate healthcare but no one ever talks about it as a disability. So right. whereas we who have disabilities can shout about it and talk about it, it's still something that's moving forward slowly, but still not understood as really being not only something that many people have disabilities, but something that people are afraid of. I think people are very threatened by disability and you don't really gravitate to something you're threatened by. Uh -huh. And for me, and I think technology is really a perfect example. We need to be allowing people to understand that disability is here to stay, that people should not be afraid of it, but be in front of it and learn about what it is that they may need as they grow older and experience different forms of disabilities. Technology, the reason why I talk about it is, you know, I'm older, I'm not that savvy in technology. So I'm just as a regular consumer needing to learn things, but then my disability does have an impact on my ability to use things like keyboards and the need for um, naturally speaking and other forms of technology. Many people don't know it even exists and they don't know how to make print in their uh, screen larger or how to change the colors or um, how to do captioning, any one of a number of things. So I think that's the answer of why Kristen didn't know and why so many other people don't know. Sorry for the long answer. No, I love the long answer. And you know, you hit a, across so many things when you were talking about you know, why should we be, why should we be grateful? There was a thing in the, uh, a little uh, response that you gave to one of the boards that you were talking to uh, about, um, you, how can you expect me to be grateful just because you've made the bathroom accessible? You know, I should be able to use the bathroom in the same way as anyone else. And you expect gratitude from me for that. I love that part of your badass persona that I love. But you know, and, it's like um, people, people don't think about it. I mean, when you look at the fact that airplanes have a wheelchair accessible sig a symbol on a bathroom that is not at all wheelchair accessible, that simple things on an airplane, like the armrest being able to go up, it's not required that even in a new plane that all armrests go up. And for people transferring or being lifted, like myself, that would make things so much easier. But bathrooms, yes, they're, it's great about what's been happening as a result of ADA and state laws and local laws. But you know, there are still many places where bathrooms are not accessible. Um, and when you talk about, about people being inspired this uh, uh, Nick Steenout who used to work here at Nobility and he's a wheelchair user, he said, you know, I just think of it like inspiration porn. And Haben Gurma, who was our keynote a couple of years ago, she, she, when someone would say to her, Haben, you're so inspirational, she'd say, well, and what have I inspired you to do? What action will you take because you are inspired? What, it, what is the outcome of that inspiration? I think those are, those are really good things for us to keep in mind when we're... Um, you know, when, when we're trying to comment on, on the lives of people with disabilities and, and, and when you started talking about technology, you know, 
I mean, Access U is a technology conference, right? And today is Global Accessibility Awareness Day. It was more than 20 years ago. I know it was more because it was when Nobility was almost brand new. I read a quote from you that said, for most people, technology makes things easier. For a person with a disability, it makes things possible. And for years, I had that on my email signature. You know, this Judith Human says this and she knows. And so you talked about being um, not as agile in technology, maybe as younger adopters, but how does it, how do you think about, how does tech feature in your life now? Is it more of a hindrance or a help? Um, and, and what do you see the role of technology is in promoting equity in education and, and employment? Is it, is it helpful or do we expect technology to do it all so that we forget the humanness behind it? Or do you, do you want to talk a about that? I think it's a little of everything that you've said. And one of the big questions is how are disabled people being included in technology advances. So we look at AI. We're now hearing more and more people talking about how AI is making it more and more difficult for disabled people to apply for jobs or to be given interviews because of algorithm, algorithms that exist that may just be bouncing resumes out. And the difficulty of people being able to get to speak to people within companies to be able to do things that we used to do, like do an informational interview. Um, technology, obviously, in the period of COVID before and after, is very important and accessible so that blind people and deaf people and physically disabled people and people with intellectual disabilities and others are able to use it, but it also means that people need to be trained. And one of the issues that I'm very concerned about and have been for a long time is what is happening to people, uh, students, elementary and secondary students um, who are not being taught how not only to use technology, but how to, um, sorry, not only how to use technology, but how to be involved in the design of technology. Uh -huh. But I think all too frequently disabled students, certainly those who have intellectual or developmental disabilities or some mental health disabilities may not be participating in appropriate programs in their elementary schools and their high schools. So if they're not getting the training that they need they may well not be able to obtain jobs that they otherwise could be qualified for. In too many cases, I think we just think that disabled people can't, and then we don't teach, and then people haven't learned, and then it's much more difficult, not that they didn't have the capacity to do it. Um, when you think about automated cars, driver, driverless cars, I think, you know, one issue is if the disability community hadn't jumped in early to really get involved in this, the industry likely would have gone ahead and not looked at us as a constituency. Thankfully, uh -huh. that's not happening. But when we look at COVID again, and we look at populations of people in rural or urban areas who don't have access to the internet or don't have access to updated technology, uh, disabled people who don't have appropriate assessments or who don't have the money to be able to buy the kind of technology they need or to be trained on the technology they need. These are all issues of concern, again, not just for disabled people, but definitely we need to make sure that disabled people are really seen as a part of the solution and as a part of the population that need to be focused on. Oh, that is so true. You know, Cindy Rowland has a great question in the, in the Q and A here about, 
She says one powerful aspect of the disability rights movement that you were a leader of was the ability to show up and be disruptive to the status quo. She says, as you know, most of us here at Access U are working to make the web an inclusive and accessible place for all. For over 20 years, we have advocated, we have provided awareness, we have engaged in policy discussions, we have engaged many, yet the picture is changing very little with respect to digital accessibility. So Cindy asks if you have any thoughts on how our community can show up and disrupt in the digital world. I mean, I'll give you my thoughts, but that's a real discussion that you all need to have. You know, what is it that you're doing that's not enough? And I don't want to put the blame, but I do want to say that the system needs to be disrupted in order for people to pay attention. When UC Berkeley was sued because uh, they didn't have captioning on the courses that they had online, they chose just to pull everything down. Now, that's not the right answer. Um, and I, it's not just in technology that progress is too slow. I think we need to be more demanding. Organizations really need to have discussions about why, why do you believe that things are changing so slowly? I believe it's leadership isn't being held accountable. Um, faculty, staff, students, the business community, the general society, many disabled people not knowing that they have rights, not demanding. But I think, you know, we've seen that when groups come together and really are more public, more demanding, create an agenda, that things are happening. I think we need more vivid dis uh, descriptions of stories. What didn't happen and what was the adverse effect? What could have been done that wasn't been done? holding people accountable for that. And I think that's really, when you think about section 504, yes, the Bay Area is where the demonstration was by far the longest and the loudest, but there was an organization created in 1975 called the American Coalition of Citizens with Disabilities, led by Frank Bow and a number of other people, including Eunice Fiorito, and it was a cross-disability organization. I was on its board. Um, it was a very important group because it highlighted um, not only 504, but other provisions of law that needed to be addressed. And um, it was through the action of that organization and all of its members that we were able to really bring the voices of disabled people forward. And, and um, come as a unified group. Yeah. And we were able to recognize ourselves that we had to stop the government from doing what was possible, which was weakening a set of proposed regulations right. that were already weak. And I think we've done that over and over again. You gotta believe that what you, what you believe is right. I think you have to do things where you're not by yourself. Look at various organizations, work hard, speak up, speak out, and use our rights under the law, file complaints, do things that really hold people accountable. You know, that it's, it's, it, it's really interesting to me too, to think about the, um, the intersectionality, right, between the racial justice movement and the and the civil rights of people with disabilities. I I saw another quote from you that that uh, where you said if uh, uh, that you were inspired by by the racial the civil rights movement, and after watching the 1963 march on Washington, that uh, you noted that in those days, civil rights legislation did not include protections for people with disabilities. So if we were to have the same rights and protections as others in America, we too would need to create a movement to secure those rights and protections. We too would need to help 
develop and pass laws to guarantee those rights and protections. We too would need to begin to organize and fight for our civil rights. And yet when I saw the movie, it seemed very naturally um, intersectional or, or uh, I mean, there were black people as counselors and as, and as uh, campers there it, and, and at the sit-ins that um, in, in the federal building in, in those parts of, and, and in the leadership as well. And so uh, I, I wonder how have we become or, or have we become more um, siloed in our advocacy since the since the time when when you launched your movement and how do we how do we address that because for me the last couple of years i have had a lot of discussions with my friend laney feingold about the fact that boy this business that we're in of digital accessibility is awfully white there's you see panel after panel of leadership organizations where there are no black people on the panels. There are no black people in speaking roles. There are no black people. And so, you know, I've the people over at the Center for Minorities and Disability Studies in IT, they're black led. There are two women, uh, black women who who lead the organization. And um, and so I think there there's an effort um, on their part to to really bring those those strengths together but i don't see i don't see it happening as naturally as it seemed that it was happening in your book and in the film do you have any thoughts about how that disconnect happens well let me first start off by talking about the civil rights act in the 60s the fact that disability community was not included is is not a surprise because there really was no movement so if there weren't people advocating to include disabled people as a category, um, it's not the fault of anybody that that didn't happen. In 1968, there actually was um, some movement to try to amend the law um, and include disability, but rightfully, there was real concern about amending the law because of the conservative nature of the Congress and how it could result in amendments to the Civil Rights Act that would have adversely affected uh, the community. So that didn't move it, move forward. It took until uh, 1990 when we had 504 and the ADA to really become pretty much on par with what the Civil Rights Act was granting. But when we look at even the Civil Rights Act, we still see major issues of discrimination that go on. So. We know that laws get implemented effectively, the harder we work on it, the more we uncover when laws are not being obeyed and work on getting them obeyed. But as far as the disability community itself is concerned, I think one of the other very positive aspects is that the movement itself is becoming much more diverse. I think the voices of Black and Latino and Indigenous and disabled people from the LGBTQ community and other religious communities, et cetera, is moving forward. It's not yet where it needs to be, but uh, definitely I think people are learning in part because these different communities have been demanding uh, more representation and th that their voices be heard and creating their own organizations, becoming more integrated into disability rights organizations. So I would say that if you look at where we were 20 years ago, 10 years ago, and where we are today, um, we're much further ahead. I think it really is incumbent upon organizers of conferences to make sure that diverse speakers are being brought in, not just by race, but by disability and by socioeconomic class and rural and urban. I think we have in the disability world, we represent everything. And so, That's so true. you know, it, we need to ensure that we are creating opportunities for people's voices to be heard. I think, you know, the work that we're doing through our podcasts and our, our YouTubes are really focusing on bringing diversity forward so that people are meeting more people 
who come from different backgrounds, including racial backgrounds, disability backgrounds, and really um, learning about how that enriches the work that we're doing overall. We're at a turning Absolutely. point in the United States um, in disability and in race and really learning uh, so much more that we need to learn about the oppression of disabled individuals. You know, we really um, historically don't know so much about what has happened, even in the area of institutions. Most people don't understand issues around institutionalization of disabled people, when it started, who it impacted. Yeah, and there were some shocking scenes in the film about that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I um so you know the the that documentary it was such a powerful portrait of a, a really really important time and as you said there's no doubt that the advances that were made I think were life changing for millions of people but one of the young women in our office um she she said look I recognize and I honor how far we've come but she continues to be frustrated by the lack of equal opportunity. She remains unsatisfied with inequality in the 21st century. And she said, you know, how would you, how would you advise us to continue to make needed change? And I translated that into how did you evolve into such a badass and how can we support badassedness in this next generation? Because really, I think that is that fearlessness that, that, that's what is required to keep moving things forward. And how do how is that inspired? I mean, that camp documentary, and you know, if we have time, I want to ask you about your attendance at the Oscars too. Um, <laughs> so I think it's very important that as an individual person, you fight for your rights. And for me, it's always been easier to do so working with other people, which is what I've discussed earlier. Right. Because the more voices that we bring together who are not only expressing the same views and experiences regarding discrimination, um, the more we can unite and come up with solutions. Solutions are vary depending on what the issue is. But I think it's trying not to give up. And I know that that can be difficult and it's more difficult if you're alone. So, and I also don't think we should just be looking at younger people. I think it's very important that younger people be learning about the history of the disability rights movement, that people learn, um, who disabled people are and where they fit in. I think it's important for um, disabled individuals to be mentoring younger disabled people to help people you know, move forward and not get discouraged and not feel ashamed and not hide who we are. But I also think it's very important that we look at this as an intergenerational movement because the younger population is about 6% of disabled people in the United States, school age kids, which is very important to work with. But as we know, as people get older, they are more likely to acquire disabilities, temporary and permanent. And that group is very important in allowing it to see that they have rights and that they should not anticipate that acquiring a disability is gonna relegate them to the sideline. But unlike people like myself, who had our disabilities when we were younger and disability is really who we are. I mean, I've never, I don't remember being before 18 months old. My life is as a disabled person and my goal has not been not to be a disabled person. You know, my goal is to have ramps and wider doors and technology and not be denied opportunities in jobs or, you know, involved in the community. But if you become disabled when you're older 
and your images of disabled people are either absent because you don't see see us learn about us um, or because when you do uh, you're seeing negative depictions of who we are those are the people that need to be a part of this movement also because we say that there's 61 million disabled people in the u.s but there is nowhere near that number of people who are speaking up and out about the experiences yeah. they have and demanding equality so uh whatever your staff person's name is you know be strong uh work with others don't give up um call friends get them to work with you look for groups that you could be a part of and look at where things were five ten years ago and i hope they're a little bit better and i hope you feel like you've contributed to some of that improvement and keep moving forward oh that's a great we have great no idea. choice thank you how well do you think um like there, there there's a lot of talk in in corporate america now about diversity and inclusion programs how well do you think those diversity and inclusion programs are serving the population of people with disabilities i think that there are more diversity and inclusion efforts going on in the business community where a disability is a part of what's happening i would say usually much more needs to happen it's great that the dei work is including disability but part of the issue is we need more disabled people working in these companies who can really speak to the problems that are going on and solutions that need to be created i think in companies like microsoft and google and uh, uh chase morgan bank or morgan chase bank and some of the other big companies they are doing more work um and that's just an example but they are doing more work um on inclusion of disabled people and you're seeing it impact the products that they're creating the voices of disabled people being heard within the companies to make ch changes on things like recruitment retention advancement so we're moving forward where we are as i keep saying further behind and for many of the dei groups um what i think is important is that you know there are dei um groups within these companies for women lgbtq disability uh, black latino indigenous etc women um or gender i think disability needs to be across all these groups not just as a separate group absolutely um it needs a separate group so people can really discuss issues but i also think we need to look at disability across all these groups same thing at universities studies you know gender studies uh black studies latin studies etc latino studies on and on typically disability is not a part of those studies um you know you're seeing a little bit more going on in college campuses with disability studies but still you know there are very few schools where uh, you can have a major uh, in disability studies and i think people need you know one of the most common issues that people have raised and that was one of your first questions is why didn't we know the story yeah well you don't know the story if it's not being told and so i think that's a huge issue the story needs to be told well judy we are at the end of the hour i can't believe it because i still have a whole page full of things i want to talk to you about um before we uh before we let you go i of course want to say thank you and wonder if you have any thoughts about attending the oscars how was that for you <laughs> it was great it was a real honor i was so honored uh that my friends jim lebrecht and nicole newnham and sarah um boulder who were the directors and producer of the film that the film was selected because it's one thing to have good material it's another thing to put together such a complicated yeah. and amazing piece of work yes and i think it tells the story 
fantastically well. And it's only one of many other stories that need to be told. It's a slice of a period of time. And um, I hope that this film is not only seen by millions more people, but also in, um, inspires others to look at uh, producing films that high quality on disability, where, I mean, Jimmy has a disability himself. He became a sound engineer. Yeah. And it was really as a result of his work and his drive that he um, reached out to Nicole Noonan, who he had been working with before, and Sarah Boulder, who happens to be his wife, who also was in the industry. And the three of them really came up with this great idea and were able, because of their um, recognition in their fields as being quality people, were able to get funding to produce this film. So and I'm that, very grateful for that. Incredible archival film. I mean, just to have that, uh, that was a treasure right there. And I think, you know, another very unique aspect of the work they did was the creation of this impact campaign which Andrea Levant is running. And I think she's done an amazing job. And really, you know, Andrea as a black disabled woman really has reached out widely and deeply into the breadth of the disability community, bringing those voices forward. It's been great to be here with you all. Thank you very much. And I think the closing remark is kiss ass, don't kiss ass, kick butt. And um, <laughs> make sure that if you feel things aren't being done the way they need to be, that you speak up and out about it and use and work with other people so that in a year, instead of saying, which I agree with, over 20 years, we've seen change much too slow, that over the next year, this can be an opportunity to really begin to move things forward more rapidly. So thank you, Sharon. Thank you all. Oh, thank you, Judy. Thanks so much. Yes. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.